electron in a box. Let's trap an electron in a box. And let's make the box one dimensional. So really it's just a line. The electron is trapped traveling along a line. And let's make it of length capital L. The electron cannot escape from this box. Also, it's a closed system. So energy cannot enter or leave the box. Now remember, electrons have an associated wavelength. That's the de Broglie hypothesis, actually. The de Broglie hypothesis says that all matter has an associated wavelength. But the electron does as well, even if it's trapped in a box. So in a way, we can think of the electron as acting sometimes like a wave inside of a length L. And it cannot lose energy. It cannot gain energy. It doesn't transmit any energy. So this is sounding pretty familiar. A wave uh, stuck within a length L that does not transmit energy. Hey, that sounds a lot like a standing wave. So let's go back to standing waves. Remember, if you have a standing wave and it's in a tube that's closed at both ends, which is very similar to our electron in a box, right? Uh, it has wavelengths equal to 2L over n, if L is the length of the tube. And n is equal to 1, 2, 3, all the integers that are non-zero and positive. So the electron is very, very similar to this model of the standing wave. So for an electron, it should be the same. The wavelengths, the de Broglie wavelengths, should equal 2L over n. So we can put that into de Broglie's equation. Uh, we can solve for the momentum of the electron if it's inside of this box. Momentum is equal to h over lambda. Uh, we'll replace lambda with 2L over n. So we get that the momentum equals n h over 2L, where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, and so on and so on. There you go. Those are the momenta that are allowed for the electron that's trapped in a box. If an electron is trapped in a box of length L, those are the only possible values for the momentum. Now we can go one step further and think about the energy. Well, the kinetic energy of an object is equal to its momentum squared divided by twice its mass. So if we put in our uh, expression for the momentum of an electron trapped in a box, we can get an expression for the energy. The energy of an electron trapped in a box is equal to n squared h squared over 8m l squared. Those are the energies allowed for an electron in a box. Now, that's crazy. Take a step back. That means that an electron in a box cannot just have any old energy. It can only have the energies given by that equation. E equals n squared h squared over 8m l squared. The allowed energies for an electron in a box are discrete. They are not continuous. That's important. Let me repeat myself. If we treat an electron as having wave-like behavior, if it's trapped in a box, the energies for that electron are not continuous. It cannot have any old energy. The energies are discrete. Now let's shift gears for a moment. Let's think about atoms. Under certain conditions, elements can emit and absorb only certain wavelengths or, or frequencies. We'll think about wavelengths at the moment. So for example, if we have hydrogen and it's emitting light under these special conditions, it can only emit visible light at 410 nanometers, 434 nanometers, those correspond to purplish bluish colors, 486 nanometers, which is a cyan color, and 656 nanometers, which is a red color. So if hydrogen is emitting light, then it will only emit visible light at four wavelengths. It cannot emit light, and it does not emit light at other wavelengths. Now, if we have white light that passes through hydrogen gas, then if we are on the other side of that hydrogen gas, we will see that only certain wavelengths have been absorbed by the hydrogen gas. And those wavelengths are the same as the ones that it emitted previously. It will only absorb 410 nanometers, 434 nanometers, 486 nanometers, and 656 nanometers. And Balmer, this guy, uh, realized that the allowed wavelengths 
uh, are given by an equation or a formula called the Balmer formula. 1 over lambda equals r, a constant, times 1 over 4 minus 1 over n squared. No one understood why this formula worked, but it did. So only certain wavelengths of light are emitted and absorbed by hydrogen. Now, wavelengths, remember, different wavelengths of light correspond to different energy photons. So that means that only certain energy photons are emitted or absorbed by hydrogen. And that means that atoms have certain discrete allowed energies associated with them. That's starting to sound familiar. Atoms do not have continuous energies associated with them. They have certain discrete allowed energies. Trapping that electron in the box is starting to sound a little less crazy now. This all leads us to the Schrodinger model. So de Broglie told us that electrons are associated with a wavelength, the de Broglie wavelength. Schrodinger said that the wave that's associated with the piece of matter, like the electron, that wave is the wave function, which is represented by the letter psi, Greek letter. Looks like a trident that's melted a bit on the side. He also had an equation to tell us what that wave function is. I'll write it down. It's called the Schrodinger equation, and it has a lot of symbols that you may not understand yet. That's okay. I'm just writing it down so that you see it. The meaning of the wave function, if you solve for it, the wave function, the absolute value squared, tells you the probability of finding the electron at a given location. So if you solve for the wave function, take the absolute value and square it, that'll tell you the probability of finding the electron, or whatever piece of matter you have, at a given location. So it's important to note that the Schrodinger model only tells us the probability of finding an electron at a given location. It does not tell us exactly where the electron is located. That's a little odd. That's a shift from everything we've seen since Newton. Well, before Newton, really. Before, we used to solve for the location of an electron. Put a kinematic equation or whatever there, and you'd solve for where an electron is. In the Schrodinger model, you cannot do that. All you can do is solve for the wave function, and the wave function tells you the probability of finding an electron at a given location. It's quite a shift. Now, let's take this wave function, and let's apply it to an atom an electron in an atom. I'm going to do this in only a very basic way, but let's think about that electron as a wave function, and let's think about it as a standing wave. Now, if it's in an atom, it's not going to be along a line. It's going to be in more of an orbit. When we think about electrons in the Bohr model, they're in these rings. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this standing wave that's on a straight line, and I'm going to imagine bending it. I'm going to imagine bending it around until the horizontal line is now a circle. And that standing wave then fits into that circle. This is roughly the idea of the electron's wave function fitting into these allowed orbitals of electrons in the atom. This is a simplified model. In reality, the actual wave function, the wave that represents the electron when it's in these allowed orbitals, is three-dimensional. And it's a little tough to picture a three-dimensional wave. Um, we're not going to try to draw it. I'm not going to try to draw it. You may. But we can come up with simulations. And we can definitely come up with equations that describe the wave function. Now, these equations are complicated, and they're a little beyond the scope of what I'm going to talk about today. But if you get that wave function, you can find the corresponding wavelengths and energies for that wave function. And it turns out that for an electron in a hydrogen atom, the corresponding energies that are allowed are E, that's the energy, is equal to negative 13.6 electron volts divided by n squared where n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and so on. So, for the electrons in a hydrogen atom, 
there are only certain allowed energies. That should sound familiar. That sounds a lot like our electron in a box. Electrons in orbitals can only have certain energies. This also explains the emission and absorption spectra that we saw. For an emission spectrum, imagine that an electron leaps from an energy corresponding to n equals 6 down to an energy corresponding to n equals 2. Then it will emit a photon of the energy that's equal to that difference, the difference in the energy levels. So only a very specific energy photon will be emitted, which means that only a very specific frequency photon will be emitted. And that's just like what we saw. Every line in the emission spectrum corresponds to a specific leap between two energy, two allowed energy levels in the hydrogen atom. And the absorption spectrum is just the reverse of that. It corresponds to a leap between two allowed energy levels, but in the opposite direction. Because in that case, the photon is being absorbed. So we started out by accepting the de Broglie hypothesis. We then said that the wave associated with the electron is described by the wave function, which you can get using the Schrodinger equation. And the wave function, if we take the absolute value of it and square it, it tells us the probability of finding the electron at any given location. And if we apply the idea of this wave function to an electron in a hydrogen atom, we can derive the energies that are allowed for the electron in these orbitals of the hydrogen atom. And these energies allow us to explain why the hydrogen spectrum looks like it does. And that is a huge, huge success of the Schrodinger model. Now we're going to shift gears and talk about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle states that one cannot exactly measure simultaneously the position and momentum of an object with total precision. Mathematically, we would write this as the uncertainty in x position multiplied by the uncertainty in p, the momentum, must be greater than or equal to h over 4 pi. So if we take the uncertainty in the position and multiply it by the uncertainty in the momentum, it must always be greater than h over 4 pi. Now that's not because we're terrible at measuring things and we have bad methodology when it comes to measuring position and momentum. That's not a statement of this. What this is a statement of is that it's built into the physics. We cannot measure the position and the momentum with total precision. There is a limit to the product of the uncertainty in the momentum and the position. So if we do our very best measurement of an object, then the uncertainty in the momentum times the uncertainty in the position will equal for h over 4 pi. So what that means is that there's a trade-off here. You may get a very precise measurement of the position, which means that delta x is very, very small. But if delta x is very, very small, then that implies that delta p must be very, very large. That means you have a very imprecise measurement of the momentum, or vice versa. If delta p, the uncertainty in the momentum measurement, is very, very small, then the uncertainty in the position measurement will be quite large. That is built into the physics. That is a result that Heisenberg found based on previous results. We're not going to derive this, but this is a result of quantum mechanics. Also, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle can be stated as a relationship between uncertainty in energy and uncertainty in time. The uncertainty in the energy multiplied by the uncertainty in the time must also be greater than h over 4 pi. And again, it's not because you happen to be bad at measuring energy and time. This uncertainty principle is built into the physics. And if it seems odd, you're right. It's a very strange fact, and people have debated this and discussed the meaning of this since it was found. But since it was found, it has been shown to be true in experiment after experiment.